All right, Brian, you went in the Colt. You got to swear to the Moon Knight Creed. Yeah, I'm ready. Both feet in. Let's go. Do you, Brian Banner, swear to protect the innocent, the travelers of the night? I do. Do you swear to be a loyal avatar to the demigod Khonshu, the ancient defender? 100%. I'm in. Do you agree to follow the express written consent of Major League Baseball? I do. Wait, what? Too late. You said I do. Still counts. Welcome in to the Bro Force Squad podcast, where we are just a bunch of bros drinking beer and watching TV and movies. I am your host, the mayor, Jeff Hornacek, and this is our review of Moon Knight, episode six, I guess the season one finale, entitled Gods and Monsters. I am joined, as always, by the American hero, Nate Thurmond, and the mad scientist, Brian Banner, to review this TV episode as we do all of our TV episodes using the four Bro 4 Squad criteria, which is the acting, the story, our favorite scene, and then theories or questions going forward. Or I guess anytime it's a finale of sorts, we do our final thoughts. So let us dive right in with the acting and cast. Nate, you can talk about this particular episode, episode six, or I guess just your impressions of this first uh, season of Moon Knight and the performances that we got. What'd you think? Uh, yeah, just overall, I'll kind of start off with that. Um, kind of a, a theme we've had along here, but Ethan Hawke was great in this. Um, he he kind of carried it through um, the whole series. Uh, I, I feel like he was really embodying the role. Um, he brought a lot, and honestly, he wasn't obviously the main character. The main character was Oscar Isaacs, Mark Spector, and Stephen Grant, but he felt like he was. He felt like he was like almost an anti-hero. Um, so... At times, you 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 weren't really rooting against him. Um, he, I think he was playing that role so well, um, and he really embodied it. Um, that that was kind of the standout performance throughout the whole series. Um, specific to the last episode, um, not too much stood out. Honestly, some of the back and forth switching between Mark and Stephen um, at, at such a rapid pace actually kind of got annoying to me. Um, I understand. Finally, you're on yes. board with me. <laughs> yeah. Like it was, but like literally, like sentence by sentence, um, in a couple parts, and I was, it's too much. I understand what you're trying to do, like showing the cohesion for that, but, and it doesn't matter what actor was doing it. It was just shit. I did not enjoy it at all. Um, and then I kind of followed over to with Layla's character. Whenever uh, I don't even know the fucking god's name, but the hippo god Towerette, I think that was one. fucking cringeworthy. Whenever she took over her body and was doing her voice, I. I could not handle that at all. It was awful. The, the whole Towerette character is pretty bad to me. And I, fe- although I liked the look of it when Layla was possessed, it just felt so shoehorned in at the end. Like, well, and now she needs to be, be possessed and be an avatar. And I was, I, was, I'm not, I was actually fine with that part in the story and the plot. Uh, I just cannot stand the voice. I don't know why all the other gods have a menacing kind of stereotypical voice you would think that an ancient god had. And this one's got some weird British hipster accent i don't know what to call it it's not even close but right. um more modern day i'm just like i'm not having it you're trying to be funny with it it's not funny only thing i will say because i i pretty much agree with everything you just said um a lot of people are just giving oscar isaac praise for this show but i think and you kind of echoed this ethan hawk to me is the standout performer of yeah. the series and I, I don't think banner will disagree and I'm actually fine with, in the finale, I think the performances in general took a back seat because it kind of became like a superhero show. And for me, it's too little too late and, and doesn't yeah. feel... The whole ser- theme of this series, and probably intentionally, is that it feels like there's no cohesion week to week in the episodes. Mm-hmm. Like every single time it feels like they have a different goal and a different idea of where the show should go. Um one positive I do want to mention, because sadly the last three weeks they've been few and far between for me, and I don't think we've really talked about him, but F. Murray Abraham, who did the voice of Conchu in this series, I actually thought his voice was perfect for Conchu. 
Mm-hmm. And yeah, when they introduced Amit, um, just comparing like the two main gods and their voices, Kanchu's voice was way better. As, uh, oh, yeah. Pretty menacing. I thought it fit really well. Amit's voice was kind of weird. I don't know if they're doing some weird, almost a lisp thing with the alligator mouth, but it's kind of weird. Yeah. How would an alligator talk? Well, they would have a lisp <laughs> first off. Of course. Yeah. For sure. All right, Banner, have at it. Positive or negative acting wise? Uh, I echo what you guys say about Ethan Hawke. I think he was extremely underutilized uh, in this show. Um, whether we get him in the second season or not is up in the air, I think, <laughs> just on how it ended. You know, we'll, we'll see. see. Yeah. Um, but uh, this this episode specifically, I actually thought compared to when Oscar Isaacs was going in between the Avatar and – uh, Mark Spector or Stephen Grant or whoever it was whenever they were in that little cons- uh, council thing a few episodes ago. Uh, I thought May Cal- Kalamawe's interpretation of that was way fucking better. Like, whenever, I don't know, he's having like that weird orgasm thing. Oh, whenever Conchie was taken over. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, she, I, I don't disagree. I, I think, I, I thought she was great throughout the entire show. Um, and I thought that I actually enjoyed that scene. I thought it was pretty pretty well done. And I know you're looking at me like <laughs> like uh, I'm an idiot, which I probably am. But she de- she definitely had more uh, more to go off of, and she she had more acting on her part as Layla. Um, I think that's just credit to the to the writing and the scene and how it developed because Mark and his scene was kind of taken aback he he didn't really want to say anything he was just letting country speak to him her and the the hippo lady they were actually like having a conversation she brought up her dad and was like oh shit i want to my dad what about my dad so um, yeah and i think to that point her character just like there was too much shit put on the plate of may kalamawe for not enough screen time like we have her relationship with mark her relationship mm-hmm. with steven her losing her father her involvement with harrow and then in the last half of the last episode we get her being possessed by Towerette, and then Towerette mentions her dad again. I'm like, my God, dude, you can't put all this shit on the plate of a character that's had, like, maybe 45 to 50 minutes of screen time in the whole series. It just, it's too hey, much. Can you, can you be my avatar? Also, I saw your dad. Huh? What? Hold on. What? That's a lot to process. Give me a second. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was weird. Uh, ben, I want to get your thoughts on this before we move on. Your mention of Ethan Hawke being underutilized. As I got to the end of this series, I found myself thinking to myself, you know what story I actually am way more interested in? If they would have shown us when Harrow was possessed by Khonshu instead of everything we got mm-hmm. here. Yeah, I think that would have... I think that would be great. And who says they can't go back and still do that? For sure. If you tell me awesome. I, you give me a four-episode miniseries with Ethan Hawke, as Harrow and he's Moon Knight, I'd be like, well, that sounds way cooler than this. Yeah. Yes, offense. Anything else, Brian? Uh, no, not really. Um, no, that was it. I, I thought top to bottom, the acting was actually pretty good for being such a convoluted mess of a story. I thought, I thought everybody did a pretty good job uh, with what they were given. I agree. All right. The plot synopsis, according to IMDb for episode six, Gods and Monsters, reads, As Moon Knight joins the fray, Mark, Stephen, and Conchu must work together to stop Amit. And I had written down, just in, as my own notes, the layman's summary, summary of the story. Harrow unleashes Amit. Towerette somehow gets Mark and Stephen back to the real world and with Conchu. And then this is where... Again, if you're just writing down what happened, this is how fucking convoluted this narrative is. We go back to the asylum, then back to London, then Mark, Stephen, Jake Lockley grab Harrow out of a different insane asylum and presumably kill him. So, a lot to unpack here. Um, Brian, what did you think of the story and plot in the season finale of Moon Knight Episode 6? I'll say this just briefly. To me, this felt like the only time in the series that Marvel and Kevin Feige was like, hey, we do need you to do this. And it, the result was a mixed bag for me. Yeah. Um, and also, sorry, I don't know how high Banner is over there, but you <laughs> found like this mirror that looks like you have at the dentist where you look at the back of your molar. It's exactly. Like, what it is. Shining it, like trying to like 
do yeah. some weird reflection in the camera. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> Stay focused here. Sorry, guys. Uh, I I think that this was as good of a bow that they could put to end this season. Um, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. This season should have been three to four episodes, and whatever the fuck you want to do in season two, that's another three to four episodes, and just give me like a, a seven or eight episode show. Yeah. I think Where? if you if we would have if we would have compressed all six of these episodes into say three, maybe four, it would have been a much it, it'd be a lot much different uh uh we'd be looking at it a lot differently. Yeah, like if the asylum episode would have been like episode two, I would have been way less pissed off, way less build yeah. up to that. Yeah, I can I completely agree with that. Um and other than the ending, which we can get to here in a second, I I was pleasantly surprised with this episode standalone by itself. Um, now, in the context of the series, wasn't too pleased with. I don't know what direction they're going with to like end this. Um, but in and of itself, I thought the episode. I like this episode better than the previous one. Um, I think Banner. That was one that you actually started saying. Hey, actually, I like this episode by itself. Yeah, I mean, I yeah. I think as a whole, none of these episodes work together in tandem. Kind of like you said earlier, Jeff. But I think individually, um, if you just go in and say, okay, I know I'm not going to get the whole story here, but just judge it on on the acting itself and what you get visually. I I was thoroughly entertained by every episode of this. I'm not going to say I liked it. At times I didn't, and at times I was like, what the fuck are we doing here? Uh, but as a whole, I was entertained. It's still my least favorite show, but I didn't, I'm not going to say I hated it. Yeah, actually, this finale, especially once Mark and Steven got out of the afterlife, and I'll talk about that a little bit in scene. I won't even say best scene, I'll say scene. Uh, this felt more like home for the Marvel shows, but I still have to say that like on the whole, I think the reason that I had such an issue with it was tonally everything before that was so confusing that like there wasn't really a landing to stick. It was like, we fell off the balance beam and then like popped up and we're like, I did it mom. And she's like, well, no, you've been rolling on the ground for like 10 minutes. Sorry. Yeah. If if I just came here the last two seconds, yeah, you stuck it. But I saw what you're doing squirming on the ground, so I <laughs> and put your pants on. This is a that, double zone. That too. Um, but yeah, overall, like in this episode, I finally got some shit we wanted. Like I was happy with the transformation of Layla, like being an Avatar. Cool suit. Her suit was pretty badass. I love, love the use. Of, loved her. Suit. Love the use of the loved wings. Her. Those wings. I mean, that first like little fucking flare out with the swords, and then the way she was using them in the fighting. Um, I mean, we got a ton of. We got a huge fighting Moon Knight scene. Um, shot really did she, well. Did she have daggers, or did I just misinterpret her wings as like a sword type thing? She had daggers, or she like yeah, daggers. short sword. Oh, that's fucking yeah. cool. Yeah. But um, used the moon really well. He takes off in the air. Cool kind of Batman esque scene with him Bad and his, like little yeah. moon crest in there. Um, him and Harrow fighting on the on the pyramid. I um, thought that was shot really well. Again, using the moon in the background. Cool Moon Knight. I get it. Thank you. Um, but then that whole sequence was great. Um, finally got, like I said, got a huge Moon Knight fighting sequence. It was fucking awesome. And then in the background of that fighting sequence, you have uh, Amit and Khonshu fighting as well. Badass. I'm going to talk so about that. Really cool. So I don't want to say too much on it right now. Really cool. Um, but I just, the end, I, I'm so confused by the ending. And I'm not really confused. I'm just pissed off because it doesn't make sense if I like piece it together. So Mark is wanting to, Mark is about to kill her. her Harrow, Conchie wants it. He doesn't. The fucking after credit scene, when it happens, what, is, what does Conchie go do? He just goes and fucking kills Harrow. Has uh, fucking Jack Lockley shoot him. Like, you, you couldn't have just done that in Egypt. It right. makes no sense to elongate this out. And then that brings me to the last point, introducing Jake Lockley at that point. It just seems the it, it seems pointless to re- reveal at that point, and it seems sloppy. Yeah, like, much. and I've got to come from the, st- and I'm trying to come from like the standpoint of um, someone who doesn't know the comics or anything, um, who hasn't done any research on it. I knew about the Jake Lockley thing. 
that he may be introduced just because I did research on things. But like at that point, no one who has any uh, wherewithal from the comics or anything doesn't know about him. There's like they're going to introduce a third personality now just to fit the narrative. Okay, cool. Was that like a last second thing that you just decided to do to fit him in here? It just doesn't it doesn't fit right. What I texted you guys was it felt like the showrunners thought that would be like an oh shit moment for the viewer and you're really just like okay okay yeah. cool at the end of each season you can just introduce a new, new personality a new great. personality didn't know about him great did. twist awesome yeah i mean i it's not a big reveal like it makes sense he has the personality disorder <clears throat> i would assume that there's more than just two people in there i would not be shocked if there's a fourth person yeah and then there was kind of some foreshadowing when Haro is putting this, the, uh, uh, what's the fucking little beetle thing? I can't remember what they call it. The scarab. Uh, scarab. Yes, thank you. On there. Goodbye, Mark. Goodbye, Steven. And whoever else may be in there. Oh, okay, cool. Nod. And then Steven and Mark not knowing who's coming out when he blacks out. Um, Finding the third tomb an episode or two before. I can't remember if it was. That that had to have been it, too. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah. he had to have been in there. Um, but yeah, it just seems like sloppy piecing it in at that point. Um, and like I said, just the whole country, like controlling Jake at this point to get where he wants. And like you had the opportunity and now you took away Mark's powers to just assumingly if there's going to be a second season, he's going to get them back somehow. So I'm just like this is just like a round a huge roundabout way of doing this. And it makes no sense. Yeah. I mean, I, again, for me, um, I, I like I enjoy the finale uh, too little too late. Yeah, I didn't love the finale, but it was a serviceable episode. But again, mm -hmm. and then just one last thing I have to say, going back to the asylum again, where Hera was actually a psychiatrist and Mark and Steven are imagining everything after we've done all that and you've presented it as a facade. It's not the real world. I'm just like, what the fuck are we doing, man? Like, <laughs> but I've literally been asking that this entire season and it's not in a fun way like i'm curious it's in a frustrated way like this is not clever or smart no at the end of the day i think i understand what they're doing i think he was that's when he was asleep that's when mark and steven weren't in control and that's when kachi was taking care uh, taking control of lockley or using lockley but i was super confused when they first went into that scene like we're in the afterworld again where where are right. we at that's so, called, they've presented that world as both the afterlife, like essentially purgatory, yeah. and the dream world. That's just a dream world. Mark and Steven. So it's just like, what the fuck? It's just when we can't explain what something is, that's where they are. Like, it's so ridiculous. And last thing I'll mention, small, but why the fuck are Hera's feet bleeding? I understand there's glass in them, but why is there glass in them? That was a random thing that they haven't explained. It's it's a small thing, but it's really frustrating. And there's they someone literally there like, never explained that. That was the first scene of yeah. the entire show. I just yeah, yeah. I don't get that part. I but. forgot about how they opened with that. Yeah, which at the time I was like, "Fuck, dude, this is cool." And now I was like, like, "Oh, cool, we're gonna get a big reveal so later." Cool. All right, there's someone at home. Like it's it means this dumbasses, and I'm like, it doesn't though. Like maybe yeah. it does, but the fact that it's like so crazy and over the top. And not even in a fun way. Like, I'm all for plot reveals and twists. But at a certain point, man, if you want to pull that string, it's got to be attached to something. And even, like, Harrow's like, why are my feet bleeding? Like, he does like, everyone's confused. Harrow is probably, like, uh, with the second director Kathleen Kennedy hired for a trilogy. He's like, why the fuck is any of this happening? I don't know. I just showed up today. Yeah. All right, best scene. I mean, I hate to take the big one. I For me, it was the... The action scene, obviously. Amit versus Kanchu, but I don't know about you. I was getting serious, like, kaiju vibes. Oh, yeah. From that fight up on the pyramids. To me, that was badass. And I mm -hmm. wish we had more moments like this here. I'm not saying they all have to be action scenes, because some of the character stuff did work really well. But to me, that felt at home like a little bit of uh, chicken soup for the Marvel fan's soul, it, which was a nice place to go in a show that, and I'll get into this at the very end, but has had nothing to do with Marvel or the MCU. And... Uh, we got a little bit of that in the end. And again, I think the fight scene in the streets was really fun, too. I love the aesthetics of it. I love the costumes. Finally, for the first time in three episodes, because I'm not counting the seven-second transformation last episode, we get Moon Knight. And even though I don't like the like businessman suit that Steven wears, we get two versions of him, which is kind of cool. So, yeah. Nate, Nate, what was your favorite scene? Um, 
I mean, it's got to be that one. I talked I talked about it in in plot and story a little bit. Um, but yeah, the the camera work was great in it. Um, the way they presented everything was fantastic. And yeah, it's what we've been waiting for for the longest time. Uh, and finally got the, got the payoff. Um, but I mean, the backdrop like you were talking about within uh, Ame and Kanchu finding the background. I mean, it, it was framed so well. Um, and that, that, I think that's one of the biggest things I took from it is like the way it was shot, like they're running on the pyramids and like the camera pans, it kind of makes it level. Um, but yeah, everything in that was great. I did, did have an honorable mention though um, to go off of. And it was a very small part um, in a very small scene, but it was basically when Mark went back for Stephen in the in the sand in the in the desert, and there was like a very I can't even, I wish I could remember the line or I should have wrote, written it down, but like what he said to to Stephen at that point while he was frozen in the sand, that is what we needed like four episodes ago, like him coming to the realization, the understanding, like you were there to make me know I was safe, um, to shield me from things and things like that, and that was like a very small line. It was like thirty seconds in that. Wish we had it earlier, but that was the character development stuff that we needed. Um, that really made that connection between them, and he's understanding like why he needs him. And then, obviously, that opened up the doorway. They got back into real life. Um, but yeah, that was an honorable mention because it's really touching, really simple. Um, but just we wish we would have had it four episodes earlier. So I'm glad you mentioned that, and Brian, I want to get your thoughts too because I loved the dialogue in that scene. Like the, mm -hmm. I, that was incredibly well written and very poignant and true to everything we've seen so far. Yeah. But at the same time, it felt like just cutting a lot of corners because the hippo tower at basically says like, <laughs> no, you can't go back. There's no chance. He'll never come back to life. And then all he has to do is just like give him one sentence about how much he means to him. And all of a sudden he's like revived. I was like, wait, what is that easy? And then all of a sudden you're <laughs> back on earth. Here's this door right to your left. This all works yeah. out great. I felt the emotional part of it, but then again, I think anything involving the hippo lady, and this is a sentence I never thought I'd say in my life, anything involving the hippo lady, I was just <laughs> out on, in general. Brian, what did you think about that scene? Uh, yeah, I, I echo everything you just said. I thought that the emotional beats that it hit were fantastic. Uh, I thought Oscar Isaac's performance of that was really, really good and uh, very heartfelt. Um and I like the aesthetic, you know, the background, kind of the dark, the the light coming up. But then, yeah, Hippo Lady comes and, you know, you can exit to your left and boom, there we are in a Marvel movie now. All of a sudden. That's all it took. Yeah. Yeah. But um, my, uh, yeah, that was okay, my, yeah, well, between that scene and then obviously the big action scene, those were my two uh, good scenes, best scenes in the in the show. Yeah, as we started talking about that scene more, it actually kind of gave me some Hawkeye vibes with um, with uh, Renner uh, talking to Natasha. Yeah, like, used his like real name and then her character name. But yeah, Barton talking to Natasha in Hawkeye, like giving his heartfelt speech um, at the memorial. Um, yeah, but kind kind of got those vibes. Really sincere, really felt it, um, really emotional. Um, I think it was a good part, a uh, very good small part of the episode that allowed the audience really connect with him i guess my issue this doesn't belong in best scene but is that this show would have been so good if you took out the whole afterlife stuff and the asylum like scene like if it was mark with a split personalities in episode four we learn and sp you can spend a whole two episodes on this showing why he developed steven but it has nothing to do with him dying and meeting a hippo on a Ryan, what are you scratching at? Right. I was about to say, I'm hearing something from somebody. <laughs> Is that you? With your little I guess, head? yeah. I was just okay. I'm just like it sounded like my... a chair creaking or something. Like a, <laughs> an old rocky <laughs> thing. Brian, Brian's in rare form tonight. Yeah, I'm Jesus. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> um but that that would have been to me a better use of those two episodes. And I think we could have more easily segued into the the epic set piece that we had in episode six and the stakes would have felt just as high but instead we had to go on this weird trip on like a jungle cruise ride at disney hosted by a hippo uh, i mean i've been very vocal about how much i didn't like that but there was a lot of i felt like untapped like to me the most interesting thing in the whole show is how mark and steven were created and the trauma that he had as a kid and we really see that in like a five minute flashback in episode five yeah 
Yeah. Yeah. It's just like, uh, I don't know. The series kind of convoluted because I don't know what it's trying to be. Like it was it the most, it was the most disjointed. I'm throwing some quotations up here. Um, origin story ever. And I know we, we've argued like, is this an origin story? Are they trying to be one? I don't know. Um, and that's where it kind of, I think lost most of us. It's like just so out of order. We don't know what direction they're trying to go here. I feel like James Franco in This Is The End, where he goes, it's called art. Get it? <laughs> it's called Fashion Honey. Heard of it? Yeah. yeah, that's basically what it is. All right, Banner, how about you? Got a best scene? We've already taken them from you. Well, yeah. Uh, that was... Yeah, just, just talked about them. Those two, <laughs> the same two that oh, you guys bad. had. Yeah. No question. worries. No worries. <laughs> All right, I guess we typically do theories and questions at the end, seeing as how... I mean, we're allegedly getting a season two. I mean, obviously this sets up to where the story isn't complete. Yeah. So I guess this is a little more open forum than it typically is. Theories or questions you have about the show, or I guess more so questions you have uh, about this season in and of itself, because although nothing's officially been announced, I mean, the soonest we would get something you would imagine would be in like a year and a half, two years. So it will be a while before anything's answered and it would, would be a good time now to bring up anything you're confused about. Brian, we'll go to you first. Brian, are you confused about anything? I can't do it. I can't say what the fuck are we doing this episode because <laughs> it all kind of came together in a like a haphazard way. Uh, I do we think Harrow's dead? I don't think he's dead. What did Lockley shoot then? He, Maybe he just like kneecapped him. I could see him not being dead. I hope he's dead. And I will be angry if he's not, but I could honestly see him not being dead. And then, because they didn't actually show him being shot. Exactly. But does Marvel show somebody getting capped in the fucking head? And like, usually, well, no. They showed, I mean, they showed Mark get shot twice in the chest, but they didn't show anything for, for Harrow. And okay. So, what about this, though? Does Ahmet have the same healing powers that Khonshu has? It's a great question. So, because we know that that Haro is the avatar for Amit now, because mm-hmm. that's how they were able to to trap her. So, if he has that that same healing ability, if he gets shot, he's he's not dead, right? But that's where you got to ask: like, is Amit still in the picture? Because how would Amit let him end up in some fucking like retirement home? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, but I know in the scene when Mark is about to kill Harrow and Conchie's like, no, fucking kill him. He doesn't, but Conchie wants him to kill him, so Harrow will die and Amit will die. So with that logic, I have to go back to Banner and say, I think Amit would still be alive as long as Harrow is alive. Um, so it kind of potentially plays out to that being kind of a twist. He got shot, but Amit comes back with the powers and heals him. Fuck. Okay. I know. I didn't want to say it's it like it made tennis, sense. but of resurrection. <laughs> God, <laughs> damn it! You, you resurrect him. Uh, I'm just trying to figure out a way to get Ethan Hawke back in the show or to keep <laughs> him fair in enough. the show. Fair enough. Can we just call this what it is? Brian made me think of this. Amit and Conchu are basically like swingers, right? Yeah. They just like yeah, pass kinda. around these fucking human bodies, and they're like <laughs> basically just possessing them. Dude, this one's softer than the last one. This one's mushy. <laughs> Thinking you put a little more fiber in your diet. <laughs> For real. This one has a small dick. What? <laughs> what? Which one is that? I don't know. That's the twist. <laughs> also, maybe I'm making this up just because you know I hate like how this has become a one-man show for Oscar Isaac. Did Jake Lockley have like a Spanish accent? He spoke Spanish. He spoke okay. Spanish. How many yeah. Hispanic Jakes do you know? Jake Six. Lockley. Oscar Isaac, it's okay. Brian only knows six. Oscar you should Isaac have just is, stuck with his. You should have just named him Oscar Isaacs, and that would have been closer. Yeah, for real. <laughs> just the mo. He's so fucking into this. It's ridiculous. Jake Lockley. Sorry, Everybody has to have their passion project. Yeah, this is his. He's getting fifteen passion projects into one. Interesting passion project. Sorry, Brian. I kind of interrupted you. That's all right. Uh, I mean, as far as final thoughts of uh, of the show, like I mean, overall, I was entertained. I was never, maybe going into the second episode, I was excited. Like that Wednesday came up, hey, I'm excited to watch it. After that one, oh yeah, I forgot it's Wednesday. Cool, okay, I'll throw this on. Um, 
and I, I just think that the the pacing of this wasn't right. I think that they yeah. stretched things out that they didn't need to stretch out, and they condensed things and cut corners when they shouldn't have. I think that's incredibly well put. Yeah. And it, to me, it felt like when you're storyboarding this, I think that the thing that really I'm confused about is like which part of this story, because there's a lot here. There's the Egyptian folklore, there's Harrow, there's Layla and her father's history with Mark. Mark and Steven split personalities and their trauma. Obviously, you want to make it a superhero show. And then we even forget the fucking French guy who like was introduced and like it was, I was digging and then he left. Like, what did they care most about telling? It felt like they wanted to give equal billing to everything, and it just doesn't work that way. Like, you got to pick something and lock in on it, and the other stuff can be ancillary, and they didn't do that. Yeah, I mean, that's that's it. Sorry, I would have jumped in, but I was sneezing. <laughs> Unacceptable. All right, I have a, maybe this is a theory, more so something that I just kind of noticed in the last episode, and Kind of to Brian's point, I'm like, damn, man, it would have been really cool to get more of this. So Amit and her, like when her and Conchu are fighting and they're kind of having dialogue about like their differing philosophies, Conchu is reactive in terms of stopping evil, right? Like someone commits an atrocity and then he comes in and fucks them up. Certainly defensible. Amit says, yeah, I never give him the chance to do that dipshit. Like I... I sit here, I'm, I'm making decisions before the bad stuff happens. Now, you might say oh, that's fucked up because technically they haven't done it yet. But if I'm pretty sure they're going to, like I'm actually, in theory, saving more lives. And to me, I just got a real kind of Thanos vibe where it's like you could, this could be a really interesting villain or at least a villain motivation where if it was explained further, I think it's a really interesting debate. And unfortunately, although Harrow talks about Amit, uh, and what his goal is a lot, we really only get kind of the same line delivered over and over like four or five times, right? We never actually dive into the philosophy until sort of the fight scene at the very end of the show. And that's something that like I would have been really interested in more so than just getting a few like one-off lines at the end. Do we need to make some hats and t-shirts that say Amit was right? Yes, I'm yeah. with <laughs> uh, Like Thanos, Amit, uh, <laughs> 24 like um it's the vp wow the you took it to the next level i like it more merchandising gurus here that's good jeez that's good but uh but yeah that was uh yeah i, I definitely agree and the other um it was kind of coming to that point like we're the same person basically I'm like well kind of i mean we just go about it different ways but um yeah and that, that's that, that was right kind there, of a nice dynamic that right there is what makes a good bad guy or a good villain is you you actually understand where they're coming from. You may not agree, but it makes sense and it's logical. And they're not just like, no, I just want to go out and fucking kill people. Mm -hmm. Like there is there is some meat behind it. Uh, like Thanos, he was so good because you understood why he was doing what he was doing. Again, right. don't agree with it, but I get it. Yeah, yeah, and what and Conchu, I think kind of the whole episode. I wouldn't even say as an anti-hero. We're kind of as the viewer like driven to see him as sort of a foil to mark like he's fucked up everyone's life he's been involved with so when amit is saying what sh she's saying to him you're kind of like yeah actually i think amit has a point like it's hard for me to start with Conchu here it's just i don't know it, we didn't get much of it but to me it was a really interesting part of the show that if they were interested in diving more into that i think i would have liked to see it especially with harrow explaining it because again he really just kind of says the same sentence remixed like three or four times when he talks about his goal yeah, yeah, I think most people can more or less jump on board with Contru more than Ahmed just because Ahmed is acting preemptively and be like, I haven't seen him do anything wrong. Like the audience is like, they're just people and now you're taking their souls away and eating them. Um, and we see Hero like kill an elderly person in the beginning and clearly yeah. states his intention like, yeah, I'll kill a kid. I don't give a fuck. And you're like, all right, well, that's what does Stephen Grant say? Like, that's my bug one bugaboo. That's what my bugaboo <laughs> later. I can't remember how he says it. All right, Nate, what do you got? Any theories, questions? Um, yeah, I've got a small one. It's just kind of weird that didn't sit with me right. But how, so, a hero in the after credit scene is in a hospital? Sure, man. Or is it like a yeah. mental ward? I it feels know. like a mental ward, yeah. So, him being more or less 
kind of outskirts of society, a cult leader. How does he get to the mental hospital? Like, does he check himself in? He doesn't seem like in the right mind state. Like, who's his, like, caretaker? Who's checking him into this thing? I, I don't understand. He's just, like, in this place all of a sudden, and I don't, I don't get it. I'm glad you mentioned this because my next question, Banner, maybe you have an, an answer for this, but – and I hate to be this guy. I really do. I fucking hate these people. But logistically, because there's so many things we just have to turn a blind eye to, I have to ask. Okay, with Harrow getting there, for sure, how does that happen? Mm-hmm. And also, the logistics of Mark, Steve, and Jake being in so many places in seemingly such a short period of time, with like no one accounting for any of them being absent, Like, how the fuck does that happen? Yeah. I mean, there's got to be some some conchu him flying around bullshit, but... Um... But yeah, and like you said, hate being that guy. Like, there's tons of Marvel movies where I just, okay, this happened. I'm going to write sure. it off. Logistically, it doesn't make sense. No, but it fits in the story. <laughs> I don't know. This one just set weird with me. Like, and at least Endgame gives us the line where I can't remember. Banner, is it Ant Man or? No, it's, it's, it's actually you. It's Banner in Endgame who says, it's time travel. Either it's all a joke or none of it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And as the audience, you're like, all right, fuck it. Let's do it. Let's have fun. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, but yeah, I just don't know why he would get checked into any type of facility like that. And like, who they, cares enough about him to check? Him? Were, were they <laughs> the still? Only... In, were they still in Egypt? Were they stateside? I don't know. Um, and I think we've been confused enough because the other hospital asylum scene we were in has all been made up. So, am I wrong, or did they speak Spanish in wherever he was at? I don't know if they did. Obviously, I don't Jake know if they Lockley did, but did. I know Jake Lockley did. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. I figured it out. Fantastic. Uh, Layla and Mark and Steven, they took Harrow to a mo- mental hospital in Guadalajara. Who the hell cares at okay. this point? Well, because that mental hospital or hospital or whatever will keep him sedated because they don't want to kill him, but they got to, you know, keep him from, you know, taking over the world. You know, that's actually not. That a, bad, a bad theory, and I, I can get on board with that. Yeah, because Mark and Layla did not want to kill him. Um, right. They couldn't just but leave him But they also don't want him running around, right. Yeah, that, that actually kind of does make sense. Put him in a place where he'll be secured. Okay, thanks for piecing that together for me. No worries. <laughs> Got it, guys. Yeah. That'll work. Nice. All right, I only have one more, so if you guys have anything else, have at it. Uh, Brian, uh, or you know. Yeah, I'll jump in with, with, with my one last one. So, um... We jump to Mark and Steven in a dream state at this point in, in the insane asylum. But it, it Which can we just say, with everything we know, this scene you're about to describe to me is the maybe the most confusing scene of the whole series. Potentially, yeah. Especially at the beginning. I th- like I said, I think I haven't figured out now, but like starting, I was like, where the fuck are we? Did he die again? Who knows? Um, but at the end of that scene, he they basically state him and mark together since they switched back and forth so fucking rapidly we're gonna go save the world now i'm a little interested in seeing how that's gonna roll out um and i'm especially interested to see to understand how mark and or steven think they're going to do that after they have denounced or been let free from conchu right um obviously it would make the most sense in a season two that conchu gets back somehow um which kind of takes me to the, the last part of the theory here is I'm assuming that Conchu will try and possess Layla at some point um, and use her as a tool to get Mark and or Steven back. Um, I could see that playing out in that way since he's, he, Conchu's already showed interest in having Layla as an avatar. Um, and I think that would be the one deciding factor that would get Mark back into that role. Um, but still interested to know, like, oh, we're going to go save the world. How? You don't have the fucking power suit of contra anymore you don't have his healing power so that's a little convoluted they're gonna do crossfit okay and then they'll be good Uh, okay check a couple box jumps and they're set Mm -hmm. all right fair enough and i guess the worst part and like this is just a uh, i think a byproduct of how like topsy-turvy the the storyline was here to where it never really honed in i'm just not interested in that in what like, if that's season two, if the storyline is, like, will Conchu possess Layla or, like, I'm just, so. Yeah, because we know where the end goal is going to get. We're, Mark is going to be Moon Knight again. Right. And the most interesting part of this season to me was Harrow. And 
if he is dead, which again we've debated back and forth, um, then like there's really nothing bringing me back to this show. It, oh, well, now we get to see Oscar Isaac also do a Spanish accent. <laughs> like <laughs> that's not getting me off off the couch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's gonna be tough to really wrap this together. And as much as much as I've seen people kind of criticize it, especially us about it not bringing the Marvel Universe really into this show. Like, they have to do something next season. Yeah. Like, there has to be some tie-in. They need to do something before a second season. And this is the last thing I have, and then, Banner, I'm sorry, I'll let you talk. But I want to ask that, actually, Banner, I'll leave this off with you. Why no MCU tie-ins in this show? Like, the only two things we got at all was one mention of the astral plane by a hippo and two books in uh mark's apartment which i only caught because i watched a recap video uh and one of them was about asgard and the other one was about wakanda so banner do you have a guess as to why marvel felt so committed to making sure this was basically like the incredible hulk of the mcu now in the last 10 years to where they're basically gonna act like it's not even part of it like we didn't mention the blip they didn't mention any any character we know like there wasn't even Nothing at all. It's almost like it's a shame to be a part of the MCU. Why do you think that was? And was that frustrating to you, or am I just being a little bitch here? Uh, I'm not going to say it was frustrating. It was a little annoying to me. Um, but I'm not convinced that this is in the MCU yet. Uh, because just because there's a book of Wakanda and right. of Asgard, like that, <clears throat> that is not special to the MCU. Like, the blip is something that is special to the MCU. The attack on New York, something like that. Um, so, obviously it is, we know because of the, you know, who made it and everything and, and the platform that it's being delivered on, but I can't specifically say, yes, it's in, in the MCU because of this evidence. All the evidence that they, that, you know, people have said and, and that have found, it's not, it's not something that's specific to the MCU, necessarily. Uh, and does that bother you or do you th- – because I think for some people – and there's probably just as many people that this pisses off. But for some people, that's kind of the allure, right? Like that's what they like about this in a weird way. Yeah, I, I'm i not going to say – it didn't bother – honestly, this, this show didn't, didn't move the needle either way. Whether it was or it wasn't, like I wasn't waiting for that Easter egg. I wanted to find it. I, I wanted it to tie in. I was just – just so wrapped up in trying to figure out what the fuck was going on that I kind of actually forgot that it is supposed to be in the MCU. Yeah. Now, I'm... now I think I can fix it though. What if the end credit scene is we see them drive off in the limo, right? All of this happened before the blip. Jake Lockley shoots Harrow blips away. Thank you for fixing it in a totally unrealistic situation because it's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I would have liked that. Just something cool. Yeah. And, I mean, you know, I'm the kid right now who, like, his dad forgot his birthday, but then his dad shows up and is like, we're going to Six Flags. And I'm like, fuck, okay, we're cool. <laughs> like, if they would have just done anything Marvel related, the amount of forgiveness I would have had for this show, and I know it's cheap and it's unwarranted, but I would have move this show from like a two out of ten to like a five if someone would have just shown up or even been like mentioned so yeah, what sure. you just described yeah i it's indefensible except for me being like having a huge boner for the mcu but it would have righted a lot of wrongs i think well and i think that it would have set up a somewhat interesting storyline for the second season yeah. is it what Conchu was doing for five years while everybody was gone is it Conchu, you know dealing with amit coming back does Amit come back? Like, how does that? How does that fucking work? Yeah, you or just, like, can you just snap a Egyptian god away? I was gonna say, or it said he wiped out half of all living things. I don't think Conchu and Amit are living, unless I'm misinterpreting. Exactly. The show. I, True. Yeah. So, I think I think that would have again given you a much better uh, crack at a second season or jumping off point for a second season than where we're at right now i really thought just because of the timing of this that somehow dr strange or wong was going to show up i would not have been surprised 
Yeah. But, alas, it didn't. Or Blade, but we can't have nice things, so. Or, I also actually thought the end credit scene may have been, um, like, the the multiverse splitting open. Mm. And Doctor Strange coming in and saying, I need your help in my world, or something like that. Yeah. So, he is not part of the MCU, but is. And okay. Benedict Cumberbatch could have said, and you can do whatever accent you want if you come with me. Yay. Scarlet's is like, I want to do Canadian next. Whatever, man. Just Whatever, A. I don't care. <laughs> All right, I got nothing else. You guys have anything? That's it. That's all I got. All right, let's go rapid fire, I guess, final thoughts on Moon Knight Season 1. Nate, we'll go to you first. Um, yeah, I pretty much spoke, spoke of my piece over the six-pod episode we've done for this. Very disjointed. Um, had a lot of potential. Very big risk uh, for Disney and Marvel doing this because <clears throat> a very unknown character. And I think it kind of played out that way. Mm-hmm. Um. I mean, if you're big into the comic books, maybe you saw a lot of shit that I don't know about. I'm sure there's a lot of background little Easter eggs that you saw, but um, I'm not privy to any of that. So coming at it from just a uh, naive bystander. Uh, But there were a few episodes I did like just in and of themselves by themselves. Um, So it still had some potential. Um, And last episode gave me enough to keep me interested for season two. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, I think so. I'll say, yeah, it's not without merit at all. And I do respect Marvel, as we always say, for taking a big swing. And I think the first time they've missed completely. But it happens. I'll be back for the next. I mean, I'm literally going to see Doctor Strange in less than 24 hours. So, of course, I'm the Marvel head. But uh, this one was a, in my opinion, a pretty big failure. But that's okay. Can't bat a thousand. Banner, what do you no. think? Uh, I think overall I was entertained. Uh Definitely was confused by the story, but, I mean, that's like 60% of my life anyway. Visuals were incredible. Acting, I thought, was incredible. Um, And, yeah, I mean, I'll I'll be on board for a second season, uh, but they're they're on a short leash. I like it. I kind of enjoyed – I mean, if you've ever listened to our podcast, you know, we typically don't dislike anything with this much passion as a collective – I think it was kind of a good exercise for us to all come together at least twice and be like, this fucking sucked. Because we yeah. very, very rarely do that. Yeah, for sure. All right. On that note, for the mad scientist, Brian Banner, the American hero, Nate Thurman. I'm the mayor, Jeff Hornacek. We are the Bro Four Squad podcast. Thank you guys so much for checking us out for Moon Knight. Please follow us on Twitter at Bro Four Squad. You can find us on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify iHeartRadio, anywhere you find your podcast, if you type in Bro Force Squad as three separate words, check out everything we do on our website, broforcesquad.com. Till next time, Nate has to try on these exoskeleton wings and this Egyptian woman costume that he got. Where'd you get that, Etsy? Yeah, looks good, isn't it? Is it a medium? Looks great. Uh, extra medium. Mm.